Hello everybody, Jeff Kelly here. Uh, I wanted to do a video on uh, the Automag, which I've been interested in for quite some time. I recently picked up uh, two Pasadena Automags and a North Hollywood. And I wanted to um, give you a little background on how I got interested in them and uh, uh, give you a little history on them. And then I'll uh, show you the ones that I I picked up and uh, I hope you'll uh, find it of interest. This is where Harry Sanford's uh, gun store used to be on uh, Colorado Boulevard, 2840 East Colorado. And um, back in 1968, I was 14, 15 years old and I used to ride my bike down there and look around and uh, talk to Harry some. And um, that was my first introduction to uh, Mr. Sanford. L little did I know that um, at that time he and Max Guerra were coming up with uh, probably the most beautiful handgun ever made. And um, that, uh, that was the beginning of, of all this. Before I go any further, I've got to mention Bruce Stark's uh, book, uh, Automag, the Pasadena Days. It is the definitive account of the Automag. It has uh, uh, Bob Babashiewicz's notes and drawings on how they made it and uh, uh, complete history of uh, the trials and tribulations of the Pasadena Automag. And it is a uh, must own for those of you who are interested in this gun. I will uh, put Bruce's email below so um, uh, if you have an interest you can contact him. Now back to the story. Okay uh, before we go any further I just wanted to show you what I uh, picked up here. A couple of Pasadena auto mags. I got the reloading dies which uh, that's all you could do to load for this when it first came out and it came with of course, the plastic carrying case and the um, gun oil, which was a uh, two-cycle castor oil. And um, then you had the stainless steel um, Allen wrenches. And they came with an ammo box later on with the Automag logo on it. And um, then you had the Automag carrying case. And there's the box that the rounds came in out of Mexico through the uh, company that was 49% owned by uh, Remington down there. So these were the only uh, automatic rounds you could buy at the time. And then here's the first one I got. Let's see Pasadena. Very nice shape. And um, the second one I got here, the grips that were on the Pasadenas were 100% checkered, similar to the first uh, Cold Python grips they came out with. But I guess some of the people that shot them didn't like the way they, uh, uh, I guess they cut their hands on some people with smaller hands. And later they went to a uh, smoother grip with less uh, checkering on it. But there's the Pasadena logo. And the other Pasadena logo. So those are my two
automax. So here are the two geniuses that came up with the automag, Harry Sanford and Max Guerra. In late 68, early 69, they were sitting around the gun shop on Colorado Boulevard, and uh, they were discussing whether it would be possible to make a 44 Magnum automatic pistol. And uh, Max Guerra seemed to think that uh, that wouldn't be a problem, so he went to work on it. So one of the components came from the Swedish Lahate pist pistol uh, that was made in the 1920s. And, um, and that was the accelerator to uh, push the um, uh, receiver back, give it a little extra push. The, nec the next idea came from the uh, M16 rifle, uh, and that was for the um, uh, rotating bolt. He uh, used the uh, ejection port from the 1911 and also the uh, 1911's uh, magazine latch. He liked the uh, frame and the grip angle of the high standard HD military model. And the P38 came into play uh, because he liked the um, recoil rods and the spring setup. Now, I'm just speculating here, but uh, Max could have gotten the idea for the ventilated rib uh, from the Python that was popular back in the 60s, or uh, Remington's XP100 single shot pistol, or Remington's uh, Model 600 uh, carbine with the ventilated rib. Now, just as a footnote, no one seems to know where the 180 comes from in the uh, 44 Automag 180's name. And I'm just speculating uh, that it uh, came from this Armalite uh, that they uh, had developed around 1969 uh, that used the pretty much the exact same type of bolt that the uh, Automag was using. So maybe that's where it come from, but the 180 seems pretty suspicious uh, as far as uh, the two uh, going together. So um, that might be an answer. So the turning point was really in March of 1970 when uh, Guns and Ammo came out with the uh, article on the auto mag. The cover was spectacular with it burning its way through those uh, blueprints. But you can, um, you can tell that uh, the gun that they used on the, on the cover is the prototype gun. It barely has a sight on it. It barely has a hammer. The uh, ejection port is on the top of the receiver. And the grips were made at, uh, in uh, the last minute. Uh, Harry had a uh, wooden box that held Cuban cigars in his office, and he gave that box to Max Guerra and told him to make some grips for the gun so they could do the photo shoot on it. Jeff Cooper wrote the article and he was so impressed with the gun that um, they started getting uh, call-ins for orders. But at the time, uh, there was only two guns in existence. One that Max Guerra had built at the Colorado uh, gun shop and um, another one that Gross Instruments had uh, put together going off of uh, Guerra's original drawings uh, by adding an accelerator. And at this time, there wasn't uh, any magazines. Uh, there weren't any magazines for the gun. And um, so they didn't really know how it uh, cycled with a magazine in it. The gun uh, did cycle, uh, single shot. Uh, it fired, it extracted. It ejected the cartridge, and uh, it had a working safety and uh, a manual hold open, uh, but that was it. So they started getting all these orders and all this interest with only um, uh, two guns in existence. Shortly after this, uh, Max Guerra sold his uh, stock back to one of the company officers and uh, left the company. 
the pressures of the investors uh, just became too much for him. So here is a map of uh, Pasadena, and as you can see at the top with the red arrow pointing at it is Harry Sanford's gun store. That's where all this activity had been uh, taking place uh, up until now, but uh, after the Jeff Cooper article came out uh, and they got some interest in this thing, things, uh, the uh, place where the activity occurred changed. Uh, because of... Uh... Jeff Cooper's article in Guns and Ammo and the investor interest in producing the Automag, uh, Harry's gun shop on Colorado Boulevard proved to be a little bit too small for that type of endeavor. So he leased this uh, building on April 4th, 1970 on South Arroyo Parkway uh, for the production of the Automag. Uh, the yellow arrow there is pointing to the uh, new manufacturing plant uh, and show you the relationship uh, to that and uh, the gun shop. So the uh, month after the Jeff Cooper article uh, came out, uh, they started advertising uh, in guns and ammo for the Automag, uh, April 1970. Now remember the uh, Automag didn't go into commercial production and they didn't ship their first gun to a customer until July 26, 1971. So all these ads were using the, the uh, prototype guns. They only had two guns uh, in uh, operation at the time this ad came out. Now notice the uh, stippling on the back strap there and on the uh, uh, front strap of the other uh, picture of the Automag. Uh, that was... Uh, replaced by um, grooves on the uh, final product um, later on. But uh, those were the uh, first frames that they got and they had the uh, uh, stippling on them. Uh, this sports a field gun annual uh, that it was printed in 1970 and came out in 1971. You can see they're still using the prototype gun for the uh, uh, pictures in the article. Here's the Guns and Ammo uh, 1971 uh, annual, and they got an article uh, in that magazine, still using the prototype though. So now we're getting closer to July 26th of 1971. Uh, you can see they've got the frames in, and uh, they've been taking orders for quite a while. Now the orders they were getting uh, were mostly 10% deposits, some of the people uh, paid uh, for the full amount of the gun. And you could order the gun in three different ways. You could get it um, with a regular serial number. You could get a vanity serial number. Uh, you could get your initials put in the, the bottom of the magazine well and also on the uh, uh, side of the receiver. Um, uh, you could get your uh, serial numbers put on the receiver and on the magazine. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, different ways uh, to order your Automag. And remember, the people that were ordering the Automag had, had just seen uh, the prototype. Nothing had come out uh, up until now on what the actual stainless steel gun would look like. So this is all shot in the dark for most of these people, but they seem to love it. The September uh, 71 issue of Gun World was the first one that I could find where they actually revealed the stainless steel uh, model of the uh, Automag. Before this, the prototype was a uh, chrome molly frame. And um, remember, it had the stippling on the uh, back strap and the f uh, front strap of the grip. Uh, this was the actual gun that people were going to uh, get. So uh, they started shipping, as I said, in on July 26th, 1971. And this September uh, issue of Gun World was the first look at it. The November 71 issue of Gun World was the uh, first cover they got with the finished product on it. Um, and um, inside is a article on uh, reloading uh, the automag. 
there was little, if any, ammunition available uh, at that time. They were trying to st strike a deal with um, a division of Remington down in Mexico, which ultimately wound up making over a million uh, rounds uh, for the Automag. But uh, at this point, you had to be a reloader to enjoy uh, your new uh, automatic. So as we're looking at uh, some more of this uh, advertising and articles on the Automag, I just wanted to mention one of the unsung heroes of this, and that was Bob Babashiewicz. He came in in uh, November of 1970. He was a friend of Max Guerra's, and uh, Harry hired him to be... Um, an engineer and designer, and he really um, smoothed out uh, Max Guerra's design. Uh, if you look at Bruce Stark's book uh, in the back, he's got all of Bob's notes and design changes and improvements, and he was really the one that got the Automag um, working smoothly and uh, uh, was really as I say, the unsung hero on this thing. So um, let's go on and uh, talk about what makes the uh, Pasadena uh, gun more special than the others. Uh, the parts that made up the gun were, of course, the barrel, the action, the rib, accelerator, the accelerator block, the accelerator pin, um, the rear sight assembly, the sight pin, um, the block that slides into the frame, and the barrel latch. Uh, all these uh, parts on the original Pastina guns were made from uh, Carpenter 455 uh, bar stock. Um, after the uh, uh, North Hollywood gun started coming out, uh, the accelerator pad was changed to 4150 steel, and um, they changed the um, uh, accelerator pad to 17-4 pH steel. And in November of 74, the uh, breech assembly, was, uh, which contains the lugs, was changed to 17-4 um, pH steel. Uh, also, the rear sights uh, were changed to 1050 steel so they could be blued and eliminate uh, glare. The uh, rifling on the barrel was a 1 and 18 twist uh, with eight equal width lands and grooves. Uh, the torque created by um, unlocking the bolt uh, was believed to be canceled out via the left-handed twist, which was uh, an interesting twist to the story, shall we say. So, as with all things, uh, after the original Pasadena, uh, they started trying to find ways to make things cheaper uh, in uh, every iteration of it thereafter. So, I think anyone familiar with the Automag story knows that uh, they were selling these about $1,000 uh, less than what they actually uh, cost them to make. Um, they were selling the guns to their distributors for about $170 a gun, and the distributors were charging anywhere from $217 to $240. So um, things were always tight at the manufacturing plant, and Harry came up with some ingenious ways to keep things going. Um, it, all, most of all the parts were uh, made by uh, vendors. Uh, they'd bring in the frames. Uh, they would bring in the... Uh, uh, triggers and hammers and grips and such. And um, Harry had to juggle how he was going to pay for all those uh, things and still get uh, guns out the door for people who uh, wanted them. And um, so uh, Harry would, uh, a lot of times, uh, trade frames as collateral for uh, uh, $15,000 loans, or trade uh, uh, barrels as collateral, or bolts as collateral, um, or whole guns without the bolts as collateral uh, to get parts in. Uh, so 
uh, a lot of parts were out there in vendors' hands pre-bankruptcy, and that lends a lot to the next story. The green arrow points to the next chapter in the Automag saga, which is uh, Bob Babashiewicz's house in Rosemead. Coming up next, the North Hollywood Automag. <laughs>